So we have a, a, a new energy form. So what is new energy? There is a lot of new uh, ways of generating energy that are not part today of the grid. You know, the solar energy, the wind, uh, the offshore energy, marine energy, and uh, uh, hydrogen, bio, nuclear, geothermal, and so on. So all those energies, of course, will have to part, make part of the grid. And one of the way of making it uh, part of the grid is to store this energy and use what we call smart grid technologies. So why do we need smart grid technologies? We will address next. But inside the forum of the energy storage and smart grid technologies, we have the energy storage, we have smart grid regulation, policy and investment, grid integration and energy storage, and our most important panel of the, of the whole, <laughs> smart grid interconnections, communication, and implementation. Okay, so let me proceed a little bit about smart grid. Well, uh, believe it or not, but the electricity has uh, been deployed in, I would say, in the last 150, 120, 130 years. So, so it's something relatively new. And uh, in the last century, where I think all of us were born, uh, the uh, energy started uh, with very uh, isolated locations. And over the years, over the century, those locations start interconnecting with themselves because what they found is that they will have energy in one place and there will be lack of energy in another at different hours of the day and so on. So they started to interconnect. So today we have what we call the grid. Okay? So all the energy generations, uh, or nearly all, are interconnected. But those interconnections, they have present some problems, and that's why we have sometimes, uh, besides all the efforts, we have blackouts. Okay, because it's very hard. There is no control of the demand. There is control of the supply. But there is no control of the demand. And uh, that's why smart grids comes as a very, very important uh, solution. Because what happens now is that uh, the next step, I think, will be the big revolution, is that the consumer will start generating energy. Suppose today in the US, I, I, I was very tempted. I, could, I, I can buy a wind generator to my house, and I will generate uh, energy, and I can sell it back to the, uh, to the company, because I, I cannot use it. Uh, I, I, I cannot store it but they can sell it back to the company and they will give me a credit. So for $7,000, I can install a wind generator in my house. Okay, uh, it's still not economical, but those things are, are evolving in the next uh, you know, 10, 15 years. Just imagine what happened 10 years past and so on. Uh, but all this needs a way of control a way of knowing how much energy has been generated, where, how, and how the energy has been consumed. And what comes to the help uh, of this is the machine-to-machine -machine communications. So the machine-to-machine -machine communications uh, is the base of the smart grid. So there will be no human intervention per se, but uh, the different machines will speak with the grid and agree on certain procedures. So in parallel with the energy grid, there must be a communication grid. One-to-one, uh, -one, fully coverage. And that's what I will try to address here. So before I, I, I let me talk a little bit about myself, uh, I would like each presenter, actually, uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't talk about the presenters. Uh, I am doing the first presentation here, Smart Grid Wireless Design Consideration. So I will basically speak about wireless. Then we have Smart City Development in Singo, Singapore, Guangzhou, Knowledge City by Ni Pai Chi. I hope I said correctly. Yes. I, I thought we are changing. Yes, you are changing. So with Ni, well, we speak blast uh, because Akbar has some commitments and he will speak about Smart Grid and Security Analysis in uh, the context of the advanced metering infrastructure. That is one of the things I, I, I will address in the architecture part. 
And then we have uh, Patrick uh, Avery speaking about renewable energy automation. That is very, very important. So just a little bit about myself. I'm very old. I have 45 years of telecom experience. I started with vacuum tubes. Uh, I remember at college my professor said, oh, transistors don't have any future, so don't need to study. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I have books published, uh, this is one of the books, uh, LTE by Max and W Lang, a previous book, CDMA 2000 Systems, and uh, I'm writing uh, actually four books. I'm writing the second edition of this LTE book, Network Video, Wireless Network Radio Backhaul, and uh, Design of Multi-Technology Systems. I have uh, 13 patents, uh, and uh, we work worldwide, our company, Southland Technologies, we Southland International, we work uh, really everywhere in the world, uh, Africa, South America, Europe, Asia, and so on. We do a lot of consulting, a lot of wireless design. And lately we start working with utilities in terms of smart grids. <clears throat> so basically we, for smart grid, we, we do a lot of planning uh, for engineering services, machine-to-machine -machine communications, and we mainly design the critical infrastructure. Because one thing is to actuate at the level of the consumer, but another uh, thing is to do automation of the network. Uh, you need to have a very large availability, pipelines, and you need to have a very low latency, less than 30 milliseconds. And that becomes very challenging for the wireless environment. And I think that's where we, we excel. We have been doing this uh, for quite a while now very successfully being able to calculate and design networks with this kind of uh, numbers. So my talk will be about smart grid wireless design considerations, designing for reliability, availability, and latency. That is totally different of designing a telecom system. You don't need this kind of latency in telecom, you don't need this kind of availability. So it's really something that it's, it's a different design. So, to start with, let's understand the uh, smart grid wireless architecture. So, what happens is that you have here the... Sorry, the smaller point is moving by itself. You have the remote units, remote terminal units. So, those generally are units that are the houses of the people, uh, the commercial enterprises, and so on. Those units are connected through what we call the last mile interconnection. So we take a, 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 an area and we interconnect all those units, including mo mobile units and so on, to one central point. And we have several of those uh, central points around the city. A city can have 1,000 1, of those uh, remote units, terminal units. Then we have the middle mile. The middle mile now concentrates several of the uh, remote uh, units and also it concentrates uh, part of the uh, automation network of the, of the power network. So it will concentrate, you know, the switching, uh, uh, the lowering the energy, the, uh, the voltage and so on. And this we call middle mile. And finally we have what we call the backhaul that connects to the network operation center. That's where the intelligence resides and that's... So imagine how reliable this backhaul must be. Because if you have uh, unbalance in the energy or something like this, you need to, in 20 milliseconds, act it. Of course, if you need to read a meter in the, in the user house, that's fine every five, 10 minutes. But uh, so in reality, you have two realities in one. But yeah, as you can see, the architecture is very, very simple. It has remote units, it has an interconnection network, and we will concentrate on the interconnection network, that is the partially wireless network. It will have communications and the communications technology. So let's speak about the remote terminal unit. The remote, it has a, its own mind, you know. <laughs> uh, it has a, a, a distribution automation. So in a typical city, you know, you can have 10,000 remote terminal units, 100,000. Uh, you generally do polling or autonomous messaging. 
And generally, a message is about one kilobit per second. Uh, small messages that carry the uh, data. Uh, oh, Scott, sorry. That's uh, uh, okay. This is distribution of transmission. Uh, this is uh, actually is the uh, network that you have to control the automation of the network. So this is uh, uh, very critical. It's mission critical. Uh, it's uh, low low data rate. Uh, the advantage of being low data rate uh, uh, is that you can use a very robust protocol, so you can repeat information several times, and that's what allows you to provide the availability required. Because wireless by itself is intrinsically unreliable, not unreliable, but unavailable. So it has fadings and things like this that you have to design for. So 10,000 points, 20 millisecond, uh, the design hour, the, the busy hour, 10 megabits per second. Then you have the advanced metering infrastructure, AMI, that uh, will speak about, uh, you will speak about it. Uh, you know, 10 million. Imagine with the 10 million interconnections and uh, without any human intervention, everything is done automatically. Uh, polling. Non-mission critical, so latency is not critical. Availability 99% is fine. Uh, 100 megabits per second also. Uh, so it's just 10 times more, but you have many more RTUs. Then you have your mobile phones. Uh, you have the people that will give maintenance. You have people that will uh, basically do maintenance and uh, assessment of the network and so on. About 5,000 RTUs. Low throughput, conversational and text, non vision critical, and so on. And finally, but not last, uh, the utilities they have now, they want now a video network. Uh, it is very costly to send somebody, uh, very costly and very uh, late to send somebody to check on things. So if you have a video network that doesn't have a high uh, frame rate, but it needs to have a very high definition. So you, have, you need to speak from 2 megapixels. I have people asking for 10 megapixels. So very high resolution cameras, OK? But uh, with one photo per second, some will even accept one per minute. And uh, what you do then is that you can remotely access what is happening. Or oh, somebody hit a pole. Or oh, somebody uh, uh, or uh, a wire uh, is down. Okay, so you can immediately know what's happening and take action instead of having to send a crew. And when you send a crew, you know what you need because today you send a crew, oh, it's missing this, oh, it's, I need that, and so on. So all of this will help a lot, and that's one of the reasons of the smart grid. And uh, as I said, then we have the last mile interconnection, the, <laughs> last mile interconnection, the middle mile interconnection, and the high capacity backhaul, and the backhaul, people are speaking even of six months. Okay, so very, very high uh, availability and reliability. So it's not just availability, I will talk about reliability also. Now, how do you implement this network? You can use commercial existing networks. You, for some reason, it makes twice. Uh, you can use proprietary, so you can deploy your own network, or you can share. Uh, and that with the third party. Uh, we strongly recommend that the utility uh, use a proprietary network because it has different characteristics and so on. The problem is that in the ITU, in the worldwide, uh, uh, there is no spectrum for utilities. So how do you go around this? Uh, you know, uh, some utilities are starting now uh, to request the spectrum very, very harshly and uh, fighting for it. And I think it's, a, it's a required. There is spectrum for utilities. Uh, my, I was not fully correct, but generally the spectrum is, has been used for backhaul. Okay, what they need is spectrum at lower frequencies that they can use for uh, the uh, last mile. Well, utilities can use cable, ADSL, they can use uh, uh, self-supporting fiber. They can use optical ground wire. They can use wireless over power lines. 
or they can use the point-to-multipoint wireless uh, and point-to-point -point wireless, cellular, satellite, WiMAX, LTE, or even proprietary solutions. The basic alternatives for wireless are uh, VHF and UHF narrow band SCADA. Okay, this is very narrow band channels, 100 kilobits per second, uh, as a marketing throughput. We need to be very careful because what people announce is not what you will get generally, it's one tenth. So <laughs> be very careful with marketing claims because they are outrageous today. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, but SCADA has a lot of limitations because of the bandwidth. So you cannot pass video, you cannot do a lot of, of things, and uh, very hard to get the latency that you need. So you, then you can use commercial uh, cellular, CDMA 2000, DVDO, GSM, Edge, SPA, <coughs> or even Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi is unlicensed, uh, and uh, because many of our customers, they don't have Spectrum, we have been designing using Wi-Fi. Uh, and uh, we can make it work, uh, even being uh, a licensed spectrum, you can make it work. But the problem with Wi-Fi is that if you start loading it with traffic, it really gets very inefficient. Satellite, uh, well, first, satellite is very good in uh, some areas. It's the only way of connecting in some areas. And also is, I would say, essential for emergency situations. Situations where you have, you know, natural disasters and so on, satellites. So in reality, what we need is a mix of those solutions, not one, but a mix. But then we can also use the 4G technologies, or FDM based WiMAX and LTE. Both technologies are very, very similar, but I believe that WiMAX is much more adequate for the utilities industries. First, because it's fully based on commercial IP. And that's very, very important. And uh, second, there is a whole group now specifying what they call the Y grid, the wireless grid. That is a WiMAX based grid uh, for utilities. Uh, I am part, actually part uh, involved in this group also. So in reality, the, the alternatives are a mix uh, of uh, several alternatives. Please tell me when I'm five minutes. Okay, so I can run. <laughs> uh, so WiMAX is really the most uh, adequate technology. It has very high uh, spectral efficiency, uh, available for a licensed and unlicensed band, so you can deploy them both. It's TDD oriented, and that's another characteristic because uh, with TDD you can have uh, unbalanced uh, uplink and downlink, and that uh, improves the usage of the spectrum a lot. Uh, powerful interference avoiders and control, possible frequency reuse of one through segmentation and zoning, compatible with regular IT infrastructure, while LTE, LTE requires uh, telecom infrastructure availability that is much more expensive. Uh, best cost to capacity ratio today and uh, the white grid specification. Those are typical system characteristics. Uh, the, hard the hardware uh, dependable, of course, you need redundancy. Availability is link dependable, you need redundancy and repetition. And latency is delayed, you need confirmation and repetition. So for each one of the different applications, uh, I specify here a table with the reliability and availability required, the data throughput expected in average, uh, the protocol, TCP, UDP, or IP, and the latency that uh, can be tolerated and the best technology and the best bands to use it. <coughs> so in the end, uh, the utilities will use a mix of wired and wireless. Uh, there is a trend to go towards broadband and mainly this is something that I keep talking to utilities. It doesn't help just to rely on the wireless. You need to develop a very robust protocol because it's the only way of achieving this uh, kind of availability. When we did the design for Toronto Hydro, it was fine in winter. In summer, the cells drop to, I think, 30 meters. 
because of the foliage and the availability that they needed. And I told them, you want to increase the size of the cell? Improve your protocol. Okay, so make a protocol very robust, repeat information four times, and you will get cells of 500 meters and so on. For the automation part, for the smart, for the AMI, that's not a problem. And of course, uh, one thing that we always recommend, not because we, just because we do it, but you need a professional design of the wireless system. Uh, you know, when you build a building, you don't mind spending 10% on the drawings or the design. But people build wireless networks and they want to spend 0.1%. Of course, the wireless network never works and they spend in the end 30, 40% more, you know, uh, redoing the networks and so on. So we are strongly believe that a proper design from the beginning considering the machine-to-machine -machine traffic and considering traffic itself, latency and availability will save you capex and mainly capex. I will go very fast because I probably am running out of time, so I will tell you about two practical design examples. One uh, availability-centric and one reliability-centric. Okay? This availability setting design was done for a utility company in Canada, it's Toronto Hydro. Uh, basically, this is, uh, this is the uh, RF channel in a very uh, succinct way when we have the packet generators, the wireless transmitter, the RF channel, and then we have the receiver on the other side. So we have to analyze this to really define what is the capacity of the network. And then we use these curves that give us, you know, what is the bit error rate for different signal to noise ratios, uh, for different types of channels and different type of modulations. And then when we go to a ready channel, the, change, the, the thing change a lot. What is the difference between the, uh, the uh, Gaussian and the ready channel? Is the one is line of sight, but the majority of the connections are really are non-line of sight, so it's much harder to design. We did a lot of measurements in, in Canada during winter, during summer. Uh, uh, this is the distribution of the measurements. Uh, and you can see that the signal, I don't know why this change is. Uh, the distribution of the signal varies a lot. You can see, you can go from minus 94 to minus 84, 10 dBs, so that's uh, quite a variation. Another thing that has to be considered that people sometimes overlook is the overhead. Uh, here we have 15 bytes of data. Do you know how much is transmitted? 295 bytes. After you put all the regular wireless protocols, nothing special, not a robust protocol. So beside this, we need to add a robust protocol here. This will multiply by four. So it's something that uh, people that do not consider. And uh, sometimes utilities get shocked. Wow, what's happening? You know, I'm only sending this amount. Yeah, but uh, there is a lot of overhead in the wireless. Uh, and basically, the overhead, you can see TCP, IP, EMAC, randomization, and then FAC encoding and so on, and uh, another mark here. This is another thing, is that how to allocate uh, the data to avoid interference. Because generally, even if the utility gets spectrum, it will be a very reduced amount of spectrum. So it needs to be used very, very clever. And the technology we use should be prone to avoid interference. <coughs> okay, so this is just an example of a one max frame and it basically does five minutes, good. Okay, <coughs> so how do you improve the, the transmission? You do error correction, okay? Uh, you basically have forward error correction and backward error correction. What is forward error correction? You send the correction together with the data. That's forward, so you, you send it before even the, the error happens. The issue is that, of course, it's a large overhead. Backward error correction, you send the correction after the error happens. What is the difference? In the forward error correction, there is no latency. In the backward error correction, you need to wait 
get a message that the message was not received, you didn't receive a confirmation, then you send again, so the latency becomes very, very large, and that becomes very, very critical. So we need to consider, uh, that's why we did the measurements to, to analyze what is the distribution of the signal in the field, so we could we could uh, compare and analyze what is the uh, deviation that we can have to provide us the availability that we need. And that's how we were able to calculate the availability of the network. So uh, for two nines, for three nines, and for five nines, it's moving by itself. Uh, two nines, three nines, and five nines, for different error rates, what is the signal-to-noise ratio, uh, the fading, and so on and so on, and the, in the end, uh, what is my average signal ratio that I have to design for. So for five nines, I have to design to minus 67, but for two nines, I can design to minus 90, you see 23 dB difference, it's quite significant. Okay, I will jump a little bit here. Another thing that you need to consider is that, uh, you send the data, the data, you don't get a confirmation, then you send a hybrid ERQ, automatic repeat request. But this has a penalty. So you have to design your network, first the size of the frame and so on. So in this case, you see 5, 10, 15, 20, 23 milliseconds. So all of this has to be considered in the design that you generally don't do for a wireless design and so on. So here is a summary of what we did. Uh, now I will talk very quickly about reliability. It's not a utility design, but it's a very interesting design. It's our own extraction project in Northeast of Brazil. Uh, and uh, basically the issue there is that they are extracting the ore and they have to lower this ore into the, the ships. Uh, here are the ships, and here the ore is stored, and then you have these huge machines. You cannot see here next to it. These huge machines that uh, carry the ore and uh, lower it into the, she into the, the uh, rollers and into the ships. The problem with those machines is that they are so noisy, so shake so much that uh, they had to replace the operators every second day. <laughs> they couldn't stand inside the machine, the temperature and so on. So they said, well, let's operate the machine remotely. The problem is that if this machine gets out of control or something like this, and the, the cost of not using the machine is humongous. So they asked us to design a highly reliable system. We installed four uh, WiMAX stations uh, that address just one each of the machines. Uh, and with this we were able, so even if we have two failures, uh, the machine will still continue working seamlessly. And uh, then they have a maintenance period at, uh, very late at night. So <clears throat> this shows that it's possible to design networks that are, have high availability and very high reliability. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it was implemented very successfully and is being used today. <clears throat> so the conclusion is that uh, the idea is to, uh, we can design the, the network for the quality of service required and uh, we need to define the technology, the site locations, the protocols, the frequencies, code, the network parameters. And to do this is not easy. We need uh, special tools and we need special, uh, a lot of engineering to be done. And this concludes my, com my part, so I will pass to the, uh, let's leave the questions to the end unless you want to do some, but maybe we should.